happening now. So letting everybody know that that's happening. Um, and uh, finally, I'm going to introduce Chuck. So Chuck Peterson is a professor emeritus at the Idaho State University, one of the most well-known uh, herpetologists in the state of Idaho and probably broader than that, I would say. Um, so we're super lucky to have him on with us tonight. And thank you to everybody for being here. And I'll just go ahead and turn it right over to Chuck. OK, uh, thank you, Hillary. Uh, I, I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk about reptiles. I, I don't think I've given this particular presentation for about 16 years. So it took me a couple days to get this updated. So let's get started. Here is my, on the screen here, I have my uh, email uh, uh, address and I'm happy, I'll make a PDF of this presentation. And I don't know, Hillary, what's the best way to share that? Should I just have people email me and I'll send it to them? Or do you have a website or something that you can put the PDF on? Yeah, so for that, uh, Chuck will send me a copy of the PDF and then I will send everyone a recording of this presentation as well as the PDF as kind of a follow up tomorrow, if that works. So thanks. Okay, great. And if, by the way, if you have any information that clarifies what I say, you know, you saw something that, you know, doesn't show up on the maps here or have an interesting observation, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. We're in the process of uh, revising our, this doesn't show up very well, does it? <laughs> uh, our revising our book on the amphibians and reptiles of Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. So. All right. Okay, so here's a, a, a brief outline. Uh, I will probably get through up to about here today. I'll talk a little bit about just what are reptiles and their diversity and why they're important. And then I'll spend most of the time, I think there's about 10 species in the area that we're covering today. And I'll uh, explain how to identify them, uh, where we know they occur, and what types of habitats they're found in. If we have time, I'll go into their, their natural history too. And then this information here, probably won't get to that, but that'll be in the PDF and you can kind of look at that on your own. Okay, so reptiles are a class of vertebrates. They, um, uh, they're the most diverse group of amniotes or terrestrial vertebrates. I think they passed birds about two, three years ago. There's about 200 new species of reptiles that are described every year. And uh, during my career, the number of recognized species is more than double. Uh, there's, these are the major kinds of reptiles here. There's several hundred species of turtles. There's 20 odd species of crocodilians. There's a lizard-like animal called the tuatara. There's only one species that's found on some islands off of New Zealand. And then lizards and snakes, actually snakes are just specialized lizards. They're really a subgroup of lizards and they make up by far the majority, you know, like over what, 11,000 species of uh, lizards and snakes. Now in the United States, you can see that we don't have much of the overall world diversity. We only have 2.4%. Uh, uh, in Idaho, which is, the way I made this slide for my herpetology class in Idaho, we have about two tenths of a percent. And that's probably about what it is for the state of Wyoming too. Um, these are the basic characteristics. I mean, they're, they're vertebrates, so they have a backbone. They have a dry scaly skin, they breathe, which is fairly impermeable to water at least in some of them, uh, they breathe through lungs. Okay, so, and they, they, they are what we call amniotes. 
they're either born live, about 20% of them, or most of them hatch from eggs and uh, they have direct development. So they're not like amph amphibians that go through a larval stage and then metamorphosis. When these, uh, when they're born, they, when they hatch out of the egg or they're born live, they're miniature replicates of the adult. And then they're also what we call ectothermic. They have a, um, they get the heat that determines their body temperature from the environment, not through trapping heat generated from a high metabolism. So uh, this is essential. Understanding the energy relationships is essential to understanding the biology and the ecology of reptiles. They're very closely coupled to their physical environment. So their body temperature is basically the temperature uh, within some you know, thermal gradient that's in the environment. And so that has advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages are they can't be active when it's really cold or, or, or they're very slow when it's very cold. So generally at night or in the winter time are not times, if it's cold at night, that's not a good time to, to, to find them active. That restricts where they can occur. So most, over 80% of the reptile species occur in uh, near the equator or in equatorial regions. The big advantage to them is that they have very low energy requirements. So typically a reptile would have one-tenth to one-fiftieth the energy requirements of a comparable sized endothermic animal like a mammal or, or, or a bird. That means they don't have to be active near as much. They uh, have very good fasting endurance. Some of these snakes, for example, may not need to, they can survive without eating for like over a year. And they have very, very high conversion efficiencies. So typically a, like a snake will be 20 times more efficient at converting food into new tissue than a mammal or a bird would be but it does come with these costs on its activity and, and when it, when, where and when it can be active. This is my favorite cartoonist is Gary Larson. I don't know if that comes across well enough for you to be able to see it or not. So, oh, this, this really, this uh, graphic here is showing you, it's a heat map basically showing the, uh, the species richness and how it varies geographically. And I think you can see that this is the real high number of species that they're, they're down in the equator. And then when you get too far away, when you get up you know, really far north, like Alaska and things, you're not gonna find any reptiles up there. And we're in a relatively low diversity area for, for reptiles. Reptiles are important for a variety of reasons. I already mentioned that they're uh, bio, you know, their biodiversity is, is very important. They, they're a big percentage of the uh, terrestrial vertebrates. And they play an important functional role in ecosystems. The modal size of a reptile is one-tenth of the size of a mammal. So that puts them in a very different place in the food chain. They're, most of them are... Uh, you know, consumers are carnivorous, but they're eating often smaller things than other, you know, like birds or mammals would be eating. So they play a real important role in the, in the food chain. Uh, some of them, like particularly snakes, can have high economic value because they can control uh, pest species like, uh, like rodents. And they also play an important part in or important role in controlling uh, disease vectors that for like Honda virus or uh, 
Lyme disease or plague. Um, and then another reason that people are really concerned about uh, reptiles is the, the concern over snake bite. In the United States, snake bite is uh, really not that important. There's, there are a number of people that get bitten, but probably maybe five people a year die from snake bite in the United States. And most of those are bites from uh, when people are, uh, they're, they're what we call illegitimate bites. They're, they, were, they weren't accidental. They were people messing around with the, the snakes. But in other parts of the world, particularly down the equator, like in Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, snake bite is a, a, a big, big problem. And, and, you know, it kills tens of thousands of people. Okay, so for today's talk, yesterday I put together a little. Not sure which one's easier. I put together a little iNaturalist uh, collector project and uh, put the boundary for uh, the greater Yellowstone area here. And this is what this is what I came up with. So I used this to generate. Uh, some, in addition to the range maps, some dot distribution maps for these species. And I strongly encourage people to contribute observations to iNaturalist because it really improves our understanding of what's out there. So here's, here's what I came up with. Uh, this is the area and here's the list of the known species that occur within the greater Yellowstone uh, area or ecosystem boundary. And Hillary asked me to pretty much focus in, in Wyoming. And she also mentioned about the uh, Teton County in Idaho. Uh, it was a lot easier for me when I was querying the database to just do it for, uh, for, for Wyoming here. So uh, I, that, that's what I did, but the, these highlighted species include all of the species that you'd find over in uh, Teton Valley. So we've got one painted turtle. It's not native, but it, well, it's native at the very north end of the ecosystem. And then if it occurs elsewhere, it's been introduced. Uh, along the eastern side of the of the uh, Yellowstone area, a uh, great greater shorthorn lizards come up. Pygmy shorthorn lizards are on the west side over in Idaho. Uh, common sagebrush lizards are found in here. There are skinks found in some other spot spots, but not in the area here within the box. Northern rubber boas are found. This is a true boa constrictor. And they've been around for millions of years. There's fossils for them. Uh, and then these are what we call the harmless snakes. The includes the racer and the gopher or bull snake, the terrestrial garter snake and the common garter snake. And then on the east side in, in, in this area here, we have prairie rattlesnakes. And basically, um, when you get over to the Idaho side of things, then you'll pick up uh, Great Basin or Western rattlesnakes. So here we go. So here's the painted turtle. Uh, if you see a turtle somewhere in the greater Yellowstone area, unless somebody let it go there, this is the species that you would see. They have a very dark, either an olive, dark olive or a black, top of the shell. And then the underneath part is, uh, uh, is uh, orange and yellow. It's got this pattern. And that's where they get their name of a painted turtle. It's just a, just a beautiful, uh, beautiful shell. They're primarily an aquatic turtle. They'll, they'll move around and migrate over land, but they're primarily uh, aquatic. And uh, you can see they have these yellow stripes that go onto the legs and onto the 
uh, to the eye. So, and they get, oh, I don't know, maybe what, six, seven inches. This is, so the whole species has a distribution like this and these different colors uh, indicate the different subspecies. So we're the uh, Western subspecies here. And their, their native or their natural distribution is just along the northern edge of the uh, of the of Greater Yellowstone, but then if you look here at iNaturalist, you will see, for example, out here, Snake River Plain Island Park. There have been uh, individuals introduced there, and in some of these areas, they they're now not just there, but they're actually established and and they're they're breeding. Uh, they, the kind of habitat they're found in, particularly like ponds and small lakes, but you can see them in slow moving streams. I've actually seen them in the Snake River too, and then they'll be in reservoirs, places like that. One of the most interesting things about painted turtles, and it's, it's a, it's a, I don't, it's relatively unique among vertebrates. They, they hibernate underwater, down in the mud, and if and then they breathe across their what's called the cloaca. That's where the urinary system and the digestive system and the reproductive system all empty into a chamber in the tail called the cloaca, and they'll exchange gases across that cloaca uh, in the winter time. But if it goes anoxic. You know, if, if the oxygen is depleted, uh, like frogs, for example, they die if the, if the water, you know, goes anoxic. With painted turtles, they have the capacity to survive for months at a time without oxygen, which is really unusual for a vertebrate to be able to, to go. But their metabolic rate is so low that they can just use anaerobic metabolism to, to uh, support themselves. Then when they come out in the spring, they've got to clear all this lactic acid out of their bodies. It probably takes some weeks to do that. Okay, so that's, that's the one turtle that you might see uh, that gets moved around in, in our area. Uh, the greater shorthorned lizard, this is a really interesting, uh, little uh, lizard maybe gets up to six inches. The the photos I've been seeing, the individuals I've seen are have been smaller than that. They have a very flattened and kind of oval body, and they're characterized by these short horns. Now, mo there's multiple species of horned lizards, and most of them have pretty long spikes on their head that protects them from predators like snakes and, and birds. But uh, for some reason, the uh, horned lizards that occur more to the north have, have really small horns or, or, they're, or they're even uh, absent. But these guys have horns that are kind of flat and project back. And then if you look at them from the top, they have this notch. So it's kind of a heart-shaped notch that's on the top of the head there. These are pictures I got off iNaturalist that were from Sublet County, Wyoming. And so here's their distribution. This all used to be one species. They all used to call them the, just the shorthorn lizard. And about 20 years ago, based on genetics, they split out the pygmy shorthorn lizard from the greater shorthorn lizard. And boy, it, it's hard. You can, if you look at them from disparate places, it, you can tell them apart. But like in here, this area here, it's hard for me to look at the photos and say it's this or it's, it, it's, it, it's that, particularly the juveniles. Uh, so you really don't run into these greater shorthorn lizards until you get down to the lower elevations here. And you can see them basically on the east side of the ecosystem. This is the closest habitat picture I have. It's actually from off this 
picture, but this is Flaming Gorge Reservoir. And I've seen a couple of uh, greater shorthorn lizards there. And they basically occur in this open, dry uh, kind of areas, sandy, uh, sometimes gravelly, stony sails, not very much uh, shrub or grass cover. These are live bearing too. They're, they're unusual among lizards in that they, they have their young live. Live bearing in, in reptiles is generally an adaptation to cold temperatures that they can go. If you look at the things that go far north, uh, like rattlesnakes, garter snakes, rubber boas, or high in elevations, those are, those are live bearing. Here's the common sagebrush lizard, uh, not terribly common in most of the uh, ecosystem. They get up to a total of about six inches in length, but the body is only a couple, uh, couple of inches. Uh, they have uh, relatively fine scales, but they're, 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 they're pointed and uh, kind of rough. And then they have these usually have these longitudinal striped appearance. And then they're sexually dimorphic so that the males during the breeding season under the influence of various hormones gets really dark and, and gets bluish. And they flash this either at other males if they're doing territorial displays or and on the throat and they'll use that to attract the female during courtship. So as you can see, they're just peripheral basically for in most of the most of the ecosystem. This actually probably is not what it, it's a little bit more widespread than that map shows. But uh, here here at low elevations you can find them in a, a variety of habitat. When you get like up into Yellowstone, they're basically in the park at the higher elevations. They're only found in geothermal areas. And that's because I think they need the heat for the eggs to be able to, uh, to, to hatch. Okay. Oh yeah, and then here you're looking at, this is from our book, map from our book. And you're seeing that Oh, like Norris Geyser Basin and around what Shoshone Lake, places like that, the geyser basins, that's where you're most likely to find them. So here's some pictures. This is along the Yellowstone Trail. That's the Yellowstone River coming out of uh, Yellowstone at the Northern Park boundary. And uh, you'll see when you hike that Yellowstone River Trail, you'll see the sagebrush lizards uh, there. And then when you get up at the higher elevations, you know, like above 6,000 feet, then basically you only see those at the, uh, at least in, up in Yellowstone in the geothermal area. So this area we saw sagebrush lizards. They're usually more out here peripheral. They're not real close to the geothermal uh, areas, but this is Norris Geyser Basin. That's probably the best place to look for them in Yellowstone. Uh, when we first started working on our book back in, oh, I think it was 1991, uh, there weren't any museum specimens recorded that we found for the Tetons. <laughs> and, but we did find a rare animal form and we went and went out to Pilgrim, uh, Pilgrim Creek and we found them just on the east side of the very extreme edge of uh, Grand Teton National Park. But there are reports of them from the benches on the west side of uh, the, you know, the Snake River in, the, in Grand Teton National Park. And also like around Coulter Bay, I've, uh, I, I found some references to that. So if you, if you see a, uh, sagebrush lizard and you've got your smartphone with you, I highly recommend taking a picture of it and, uh, and uh, submitting it to iNaturalist because that'll increase our knowledge of the, uh, the species. 
Okay, so here's our first snake. This is the northern rubber boa. It's a true boa constrictor. It's one of scores of different species of boas, but it's the one that gets the furthest north. And these actually go up into Canada. They typically will get up to maybe around two feet in length. The females are much bigger than the males. Uh, and it's a burrowing species. So they have kind of a wedge-like head. They have small eyes and very smooth, shiny scales. And they're sometimes referred to as the two-tailed snake or two-headed snake because the tail resembles the head. They actually use that in a defensive display where they'll coil up and hide the head uh, under the coils of the body and then strike with the tail to divert a uh, predator attack away from their head. Um, they're usually um, tan to dark brown on the back and then kind of cream colored underneath. Uh, you can't see in this picture, but they have vertical pupils, which is generally for, for reptiles a good indication of, that they're nocturnal. And uh, they get their name rubber boa from the feel. Uh, they, they, they feel like rubber. They have a really soft, smooth, very pleasant to feel uh, skin. And one of the most interesting things about them is they have remnants of the hind limbs. And you can see just a little bit. It's believed that that right there, that uh, underlaying that, that's some keratin over it. But that's the remnant of the femur. And there's also another bony structure in there they think is part of the pelvis. It's innervated by a plexus of nerves. And it's really good direct evidence that snakes evolved from lizards with legs. These are sexually dimorphic. They're larger in the males and they use them to stimulate the female during courtship. So this is basically a Northwestern uh, species of, of snake, uh, but they, they, the, uh, they don't occur, you know, really like out in the desert, for example, but they do occur up in the cooler and the, in, in uh, higher elevations. Um, in, in Yellowstone, they seem to be found a little bit more in geothermal areas. In the Beckler area and up around like artist paint pots, they're found there. And then like down around, I think Death Canyon is the preponderance of, of sites. I think there's a rubber boa den right near the hiking trail to, what is it? Phelps Lake, Phillips Lake there. So, um, you actually see quite a few observations here from, uh, from the Tetons. And then here's some examples. Now, this is just a picture I grabbed off the internet of the Beckler Trail. Uh, this is a picture of Death Canyon. I, I remember I took a class there from the Teton Science School about 30 years ago, and we were walking on that trail and it was going through a talus field going down to the lake. And I think that is the reason we were getting so many observations there is because the, the den is right by the trail. I had a PhD student that studied these and this was his study area in uh, right outside of Pocatello. And we found that they're often associated with maple trees and this is in the fall. And then this is an area um, in the um, in uh, near Pocatello. It's actually a denning area where the uh, rubber boas can be found uh, coming out, either going in in the fall or coming out in the, in the spring. Okay, the next species, another peripheral species. Uh, is the uh, racer. Uh, in some areas, these can get pretty big, up to 48 inches uh, in length. It's uh, another snake that, as an adult, doesn't have a pattern. It has a pretty 
you know, sharp pointed tail, uh, big eyes. It's a diurnal species, a very visually oriented and active predator. They have these smooth scales and generally uh, kind of tan, olive, grayish brown. Further east, they get more bluish in color, bluish green. And uh, sometimes they're called blue racers east of the, east of the uh, continental divide. A very interesting thing about them is that the young have a different pattern. They have these blotches and they lose that over the course of their first year. So from the back anteriorly, that disappears until after about a year, they have this coloration at, 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 at the top. And uh, that's believed to be correlated with their uh, defensive behavior. The adults are very good at defending themselves by uh, crawling away. They're quick, that's why they're called racers. But the juveniles coil up and they freeze or they bluff strike. A lot of times they get killed because people confuse them with rattlesnakes because they're striking. So this is a species that has a really wide distribution and in other areas like back here, they're black and then they're bluish here and they're kind of that grayish greenish color uh, out, uh, out here. The, they occur, I, I have seen records, we don't have it in iNaturalist, but I have seen uh, observations with photographs of them just getting into Yellowstone here uh, along the Yellowstone River. So this is where you'd see them right here along the Yellowstone River Trail. And as things warm up, which they definitely are doing, uh, uh, you will see these snakes like gopher snakes and racers and rattlesnakes should be moving further and further into Yellowstone. And you'll probably get gopher snakes moving up into the Tetons from the south. So here's gopher snake. This is uh, probably the longest of our, our snakes. These get up to, uh, well, gee, down south, they get up to almost eight feet in length. But uh, in Idaho, we, we get them up to almost uh, six feet. Uh, it has a light brown color. It's a big snake. It's a constrictor. It has a light brown color with these dark blotches, and then they become rings on the tails. And then they have these stripes on the eyes that break up the outline uh, of the eye. And they have a round, round pupil. And I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it or not, but if you look, there's a little light line there. There's a little uh, sort of outdented ridge, and that's called a keel. And these guys have these keeled scales. This is Stephen Spear on the Yellowstone Trail. And that's a pretty good sized gopher snake for, for, for around this area. What? That's probably four inch or four feet long. So uh, now this is very interesting. In our book, we had a questionable observation down at Hoback Junction. And someone's actually given me a specimen from that area. I think it was a roadkill. And then we have them going along the Yellowstone River here and up to the uh, Mammoth Hot Springs. And you'll find them in the Mammoth uh, Terraces there. But look at this. There's a cluster of gopher snake observations here that I saw that are from iNaturalist. And I don't know what's going on with those. That is not where I would expect to see gopher snakes. And up until just a few years ago, there were no museum specimens, no observations, no road kills, anything from that. So this is, this is something that we're definitely going to have to look, look into and see if you just what's going on there, but there's enough of them there that it doesn't look like it's just somebody's GPS coordinates that got screwed up. And so here's a couple places where I've seen gopher snakes in Yellowstone. Uh, they're along that boardwalk 
uh, on the lower boardwalk in the Mammoth Terraces area. And I, uh, uh, one of the people from the Park Service took me out there and I think we found about a dozen shed skins in, in one area. And this was Liberty Cap, I think they call this. And there used to be a gopher snake that lived under there that people could, could, could see frequently. And then here's Steve with that gopher snake along the Yellowstone River Trail. Okay, this is the terrestrial garter snake. Um, they, uh, the garter snakes usually have stripes. In the terrestrial garter snake, the stripes aren't as quite as sharply defined. They're more vague. And they have these dark spots that overlap into that. Uh, the ground color can be grayish or brown. It can be kind of lightish. They, they have a variable ground color. Uh, and they have keeled scales, they have ridges on the scales. And these lip scales here, those are called the labial scales. And most, probably 90% of the terrestrial garter snakes have eight upper labial scales. And that, that'll be important for how distinguishing them from our other species of garter snake. This is the most commonly observed reptile in the greater Yellowstone area. And as you can see here from the dot, this is a basically a Western species. They make it out to the, like the Black Hills. They get pretty far north too. They get up to the, you know, up into Canada. Um, and they go high. These guys can go up to 10,000 feet. They're found like up in the Beartooths at, at over 10,000 feet. Oh, I forgot to tell you about rubber boas too. I have a really interesting observation from the fire lookout on Mount Sheridan in Yellowstone. That's near Heart Lake. He found a rubber boa at over 10,000 feet on top of Mount Sheridan. So rubber boas can go really high elevation as well. Anyway, this is a uh, very widely distributed species. And like I said, the most common species. You can see them in geothermal areas too. They seem to, to, to really like the warm rocks and the, and the heat and the soil. And here's an example of some habitat. Usually garter snakes are found near water. This is a stream on the Targhee National Forest. We find garter snakes along there. That's a good way to find garter snakes is to walk along a stream because they'll forage for amphibians and fish. Although these guys will eat anything. They're, they have the widest diet, I think, of any snake. We found them with eating bats and small mammals and other snakes and lizards and slugs and snails and leeches. This one was taken on this algal mat at Kelly Warm Springs. And he's probably hunting bullfrog tadpoles there, or bullfrogs. This is at the south entrance to Yellowstone National Park. This is a, a geothermally influenced creek just on the um, east side of the Snake River. And the uh, toads uh, like to breed there. And when the toads are metamorphosing, they'll just be tens of thousands of them and the garter snakes will come in and you'll see them just feasting. I, I One garter snake I found, I think 20 little podlets in its stomach one time. So that they, 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 that's a big deal for them. Okay, the other garter snake is called the common garter snake, the subspecies that's uh, on the west side of the ecosystem is the valley garter snake. Uh, they have a much darker ground color and see how prominent those stripes are, how distinct they are. They, they, they stand out much more. And then in many of them, but not all of them, but many of them have red spots. And when they are excited and defending themselves, they inflate and then they get the red color shows up really well. But if you look, at their lip scales, they typically have seven upper lip scales. We think these used to be a lot more common than they are now. 
they're they're relatively rarely seen uh, like in the Jackson Hole area now. In Southeast Idaho, they've declined too, possibly because of uh, the the loss of leopard frogs, which they fed on quite a bit. Um, so here's the distribution. This is another one that goes pretty far north, but interestingly doesn't get up to the high elevations that you see the terrestrial garter snakes get to. So uh, we found them in here in the Beckler. And then, uh, well, you can see there's quite a few uh, older museum records, but not very many iNaturalist records anymore. That, that you're not, not as many as you'd expect from seeing how many historically used to be there. So if you see a common garter snake, that would be a good one to get a picture of and send by naturalist. So this is an area that would be a good, good garter snake habitat. Beaver dam, there'd be amphibians in here, fish, and these guys would be feeding uh, in those areas. There's a, uh, oh, what? Uh, there's a gas station there, Coulter Bay. Uh, there's that that gas station on the way into Coulter Bay, at, and that I think it's Coulter Bay, or, may, or maybe it's Leaks Marina. Anyway, at, on the uh, the south side of their of their um, a parking lot there, uh, there's a there's a garter snake den in the rocks there. There's also garter snakes that over winter uh, under the bridge there where you cross by Moose, Wyoming. This is over at Harriman State Park and uh, common garter snakes and terrestrial garter snakes are found along the Henry's Fork of the Snake River. This is a, this is a hibernation area. It was formed by a, a, um, a um, road cut when they were putting Highway 20 in there. But in the springtime, when they emerge, like in April, you can see scores of garter snakes here in the uh, cracks in the rocks. Okay, and the last species of snakes, so I'm gonna get through all of this, good. Uh, this is the prairie rattlesnake. Uh, it, it, um, these guys can get pretty big, they can get up to, uh, 48 inches, and they're much heavier bodied than the uh, gopher snake. The color vary, they, they vary a lot in their color pattern. But this one was, uh, oh, this one was found, I think it was down in Sweetwater County, when uh, we were studying the midget faded rattlesnakes down there. But this is my best picture of a prairie rattlesnake. And so uh, the most obvious feature is the rattle. And every time the snake sheds its skin, it adds another segment to the rattle. And so you can count how many times the snake has shed its skin, which is for adults, usually once or twice a year. The young, it might be more than that if they're growing fast. But what often happens after you get more than, oh, say six or seven segments, they tend to break off and then then you don't know how, how many times they've shed their skin. They have a light brown color, often greenish or yellowish. In fact, the scientific name Protolus viridus comes from uh, viridus, I think means green. Uh, dark blotches on the back, usually, but not always with light edges around them. The scales are keeled, they have a ridge on them. They have a uh, fairly narrow neck and a thick head. Vertical pupils. Uh, and then this is what's called the L'Oreal pit. That's lined with infrared sensing cells so that they can detect the infrared radiation coming off their prey, their warm blooded prey. And, and they believe that they image with that and that guides the strike. So even if it's totally dark, they still can uh, strike accurately at the prey. This was a snake that one of my students, this is a prairie rattlesnake, but it's from the Frank Church. 
and he was doing a radio telemetry study. And I, I think that that snake had a radio transmitter in it for two or three years as part of that study. And then the snake was coming out of the anesthesia after we removed the radio transmitter. And so he was kind of groggy. So I was able to get a really good close-up picture. So uh, gopher snakes are sometimes or often confused with rattlesnakes, um, but they have much uh, sl more slender body. They uh, don't have the rattle on the head and they don't have that real thin neck and as tri triangular a head. But one of the things they actually do is they, they, they have a behavior similar to rattlesnakes where they'll coil up and they'll hiss and they'll strike and they'll shake their tail. And so they often, uh, they flatten the head and make it look more triangular. And some people think they're mimicking uh, rattlesnakes. But uh, if, you're, if, if you look at it very closely, you shouldn't have much trouble distinguishing those. Uh, here's a comparison of the heads. So round pupil for the uh, gopher snake or the, these are called the subspecies that occurs in Yellowstone is called the bull snake. Uh, the rattlesnakes have the vertical pupils. Rattlesnakes have the L'Oreal pit. These guys do not. Okay. And so here's the prairie rattlesnake uh, uh, distribution, just peeking, you know, in from the, uh, you know, along the Yellowstone River there, uh, not getting far enough up to get into the, the ecosystem from the south. And then right along the eastern edge here. And I think our only observations that we had for Yellowstone is here along the Yellowstone River. But like I said, I would expect those snakes to come up the Gardner River and probably up the uh, Yellowstone River further as things warm up. I'm not sure what the maximum elevation is. Uh, I do know they get up to about 6,000 feet in this area, but they, uh, particularly if things warm up, they'll, they'll be going to higher elevations. We had one rattlesnake that, that my student was tracking in the Frank Church wilderness, and it, that individual snake went up 2,000 feet in elevation in its annual migration above where the den was. And so here's habitat. Uh, this is a denning area in Northern Yellowstone. Uh, this area right here, there's a talus slope and th they used to trap rattlesnakes here. Some of the remnants of the old uh, wire traps are here, but this is a Northwest of Gardner, Montana. And uh, the rattlesnakes are to, will overwinter communally. And other snakes will do that too. Rubber boas overwinter. Um, the garter snakes will do that. The gopher snakes, they may share. You may find multiple species in the same, in the same hibernaculum. And then they'll move out of there. In, in Idaho, our telemetered snakes would move about up to five miles away, but like up in Canada where uh, they'll, they'll move like maybe 10, 15 miles out to the uh, one way in the spring to the feeding grounds and then come back in the fall. Basically drier regions with relatively sparse vegetation. You often find them associated with rocky areas and they hunt around rodent burrows. And like I mentioned, they have communal den sites. So that is the end of this part. And can I go on for about 10 minutes, Hillary? Is that okay? Okay, yep, so I'll do, good. Oh, sorry. Do, a little, do a little bit of natural history here. So in terms of daily activity patterns, some species are diurnal, like the painted turtle, the sagebrush lizards, the racers. Those are 
diurnal species. Some are nocturnal. The rubber boas are primarily a nocturnal species. Rattlesnakes may and gopher snakes be uh, nocturnal, but in the springtime, when it's uh, when it's um, uh, warm in the day and then cold at night, then you'll find them uh, uh, out during the day. And these guys also tend to be kind of crepuscular. So dawn, we, we put little activity transmitters in rattlesnakes and track them around and found that they were mostly active in the evening and in the morning, you know, uh, maybe six to eight, six to nine. But during the heat of the day, they usually weren't moving around too much. Seasonally, all of these species are inactive during the winter. And then, you know, peak activity is probably in the uh, late spring, early summer. And then that, that, that rolls off. This is for rattlesnakes. This is, uh, you can get, uh, this is the records of when, a number of records. It's a frequency distribution of rattlesnake records, uh, Western rattlesnake over their uh, entire uh, range. So this is including, you know, down south where they might still be active even late into the year. It's important to realize that these animals have uh, different habitats that they, or, or some of them do. So they may overwinter one place. They may, often they breed right near where they overwinter, but not always. And then they'll move out to different areas to forage, like the snakes will do that. But some of the territorial lizards, they may not move, you know, very much at all during their life. And the actual movements are variable by species. So some species like the uh, sagebrush lizard, they're territorial. So they're not going to be moving very far. Others are active foragers, like this is a racer, and they're cruising around and, and uh, they may travel a fair distance. And there are also seasonal migrations where, you know, if they're communally overwintering these snakes, they can't all stay there during the active time of the year because they'd eat all the food and then uh, there wouldn't be enough food. So they spread out. This is a migration. This is a Great Basin rattlesnake. We surgically implanted a radio transmitter here. There's the battery, there's the circuit, there's the activity switch. There's the antenna slipped underneath the skin. And we could get about a two kilometer range out of that. And so this is a uh, non-pregnant female. And uh, she went, oh boy, maybe four or five kilometers away. And then this was one year and then another year she didn't go as far. The pregnant females don't go much more than a kilometer and they stick fairly close to the denning area. In terms of food, uh, the painted turtle is omnivorous. Uh, when they're younger, they probably eat more animals. And then when they get older, they probably eat more plants. Uh, lizards are primarily carnivorous. They may eats a few flowers or maybe some leaves, things like that, but they're primarily uh, eat small invertebrates. But snakes are exclusively carnivores. Uh, this is a really interesting concept that I think is very helpful for understanding uh, the ecology of these animals and it's called foraging mode. So you can think of it as a continuum. At one end, you have ambush, uh, foragers or sit and wait foragers and then you have some in between and then you have others that are actively foraging and so sagebrush lizards are territorial they'll sit on a rock and they'll ambush insects as they go by where greater shorthorn lizards they're they're kind of a cruising forager they will go out looking for invertebrates they may you know, move hundreds of meters a day. But what they'll often like to do is find an anthill. And then they basically sit on that ant hill, on the ant trail, and then just eat the ants as they come by. Where things like racers will be out actively searching. And rattlesnakes tend to be more, they'll find an area 
where they get a lot of smell, you know, like from the rodents there. And then they'll, they might spend, you know, a month in an area. Uh, they'll go into like brown squirrel colonies and, uh, and set up there. And uh, some of them do really, really well. They can like double their, their mass in a, in a summer. Uh, they have different ways of capturing the food. Uh, garter snakes, lizards and things basically just grab it. Um, here's a juvenile rubber boa killing a small mouse by constricting it. And then of course, we have the, the rattlesnakes that envenomate their prey. It turns out that the majority of what we call the colubrid or harmless snakes also have a toxic saliva. So like garter snakes, their, their saliva is toxic to their prey and they can subdue it or kill it uh, by holding onto it and biting it. They don't have big enough teeth or enough of it to, buy, to be dangerous to humans. But if you're a frog, you don't want to tangle with a garter snake. And then the energetic requirements, I mentioned this earlier. I had a student, Mike Dorcas, who was studying rubber boas and he got a, 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 a snake road driving in a remote area. And a lot of times rubber boas won't eat when you bring them into captivity. And it, uh, the snake didn't eat that first year. We, we caught it in June. He put it in uh, hibernation, brought it out the next year. It was, he, he was gonna take it back and release it and he didn't get around to it. Didn't eat that year went into hibernation for a second winter. And after 23 months in captivity, it, it started to eat voluntarily. And it had lost over that 23 months about 15% of its body mass. So these guys have tremendous you know, fasting endurance. Lots of neat things that they do to defend themselves. You know, camouflage, there, there's the, uh, there's the, the racer, the baby racer uh, camouflage. This is a uh, pygmy shorthorn lizard. Here's a racer that's really good at crawling away. Here is a, um, uh, the horns on a horned lizard. Look at this picture very closely. That is not the head, that's the tail that's meant to confuse the predator. There's the snake, the rubber boa's head underneath its body coil. And if any of you have heard gopher snakes, you know, they can really, or bull snakes, they can really hiss very loudly, louder than other snakes. And the way they do that is they have a little ridge of cartilage that runs down their windpipe here. And that oscillates back and forth and acts as a mechanical amplifier. I think I'll stop there, but uh, you'll be able to look at these other slides. Uh, oh, one thing I should point out, some of these animals can live a long time. The, the sagebrush lizards may be only five, six years. Garter snakes can live into their teens. Rattlesnakes, uh, timber rattlesnakes are known to live over 50 years. Rubber boas are known to live over 50 years and painted turtles they have been known to live over 60 years in the wild. Uh, there really isn't, we don't have the concern about reptiles that we do about amphibians in terms of conservation problems in Idaho or in Wyoming. I looked it up on Wyoming, uh, what, Game and Fish uh, page. They considered the rubber boas imperiled S2 and the valley garter snakes. I think the valley garter snakes actually have declined. I don't, I'm not convinced that rubber boas are in any trouble. They're just a cryptic species that it's difficult to study. But often when we learn and really study an area, you find out that they're more abundant than you thought. Okay, here's a, some good books to look at. Uh, these are some conservation organizations you might like to look into. Uh, I would encourage you to add observations to iNaturalist. 
And oh, this is something that some of you that are like education or working for agencies. Uh, I, I'm an amateur photographer and I take a lot of pictures of uh, nature photographs and I make them available by Creative Commons on Flickr. So if you were a teacher and you needed or your students needed photos for a report or something, you can go and look at my albums on Flickr and you can download those for free. So that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chuck, for that presentation. That was really great. I learned so much um, and I'm sure everybody else did. There were a couple of questions that came in, um, some of the same questions that I had for you. So Arna asks, how do lizards overwinter? I don't think we know a lot about that. Uh, we know it a lot better for snakes, but um, they, I think they get into cracks or down into burrows in the dirt and they basically need to get below the frost line. And, and occasionally you'll find, you know, uh, well, I, I, I know one of my uh, students was studying Great Basin collared lizards and in the springtime, he just dug one up and found it, you know, in the, in the ground. And sometimes you can see them in the springtime coming out and they're all dirty. They have, they, they've gotten real dirty and muddy in there, but yeah, basically they need to get below the frost line. Things like, well, painted turtle juveniles or the baby painted turtles, they have a freeze tolerance. So they can freeze quite a bit of their body water and still survive. And chorus frogs can do that. Uh, terrestrial garter snakes can do that. I don't know of any lizards that are known to be freeze tolerant. I think they've got to get below the frost line to survive. Wow. Um, and then Mike asks the same thing that I've heard, and I don't know if this is just a myth or what, but about the shooting blood uh, on the short horned lizards. Yeah, horned lizards have the ability, they have a sinus, you know, where the blood can pool, you know, it's kind of an enlarged vein and it's very thin walled. And if they get really excited, like they're attacked by a predator, that'll rupture and it'll shoot blood out of their eye. Wow. And I guess photographs of that. I, if I did a whole lecture here on the defense, I've got a photograph showing a horned lizard, the blood drops of blood shooting out of the eye. Uh, one time I was handling a horned lizard when I was a keeper in the zoo and I felt something on my face and I put my hand up and was rubbing it and it was my hand was had blood on it. And it was a horned lizard spraying my face with blood. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Um, Francis asks a good question. Is there concern about collectors? Yes, yes. Um, I, I worry about, I worry more about people persecuting snakes and just killing them than about collecting them. There are people that will destroy rattlesnake dens and things. But uh, yeah, there, and that, that's one thing I, I encourage people to, you know, uh, submit things to iNaturalist. But for rattlesnakes, we suggest that you, if, if it's a rare species, it's probably best to just obscure the coordinates. You know, if you have any concern about that. It, we haven't had much of a problem in like Idaho I think people that really want to collect stuff, they're down in the Southwest, for example. But I was at this conference two weeks ago and it was in Western Washington. And one of the women was talking about her, uh, the park that she, she was an administrator at. And uh, they've had some of the real colorful garter snakes in their park have been over collected. And so, yeah, it's a concern. It is a concern. I, I, I don't know too much issues in, in Wyoming, but boy, down in Arizona, places like that, it's, it's a real, California, it's a real problem. Awesome, um, or not awesome for them, but good information for us. <laughs> um, 
Lori asks, I think I know the answer to this because I've also been musked by a garter snake, but we picked up a snake on the Death Canyon Trail coming back from Phelps Lake 25 years ago and it made our hands really stinky. Is that kind of a defense mechanism? What kind yeah. of snake would it have been? Yeah, well, uh, multiple snakes do that. So uh, if it was a, you know, short, stocky brown snake, <laughs> and it must you, it was a rubber boa. And that, that actually may be an irritant. Uh, my student working with rubber boas one time got, it's really potent, it's much stronger than garter snake musk. And at first it kind of smells even a little bit good. And then it, then it kind of, all of a sudden it really overpowers you and it smells bad. But my student got some of that in his eye and he said it really burns. And I think when they lift the tail like that and a predator attacks it, they're getting a mouthful of that musk and it, it would make them not wanna eat the snake. Garter snakes are the ones that are really famous for doing this though. So if the snake had stripes on it and it was faster and you know kind of flopped around a lot, tried to get away, that my guess is it's most likely that it was a garter snake, but both garter snakes and, and rubber boas will musk you. And a rattlesnake sometimes, you wouldn't be picking up a rattlesnake, but one time I was in a zoo, uh, working at the zoo, and I was handling a big diamondback rattlesnake, and it was indoors, and it was backlit with a light bulb, and I saw this ray of musk coming out from the rattlesnake and uh it covered my face and uh i actually uh it it i lost my vision i i it had just and then i i got a a, a really serious migraine headache from it and it basically incapacitated me for the rest of the day hmm. so there's some interesting things going on with chemical defenses with musking. That last story you told reminded me of one of my questions. Um, what are the predators, if any, of rattlesnakes? Okay, it's my um, screen. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes. There we go. So for rattlesnakes, uh, birds, magpies and owls, mammals, especially badgers. Um, you know, if you're down in the Southwest, roadrunners will kill them. Uh, hawks, eagles, uh, king snakes will, 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 will feed on them, indigo snakes, things like that. Uh, in our studies of Great Basin rattlesnakes out on the Snake River Plain, Badgers are the bane of rattlesnakes. We we had to, uh, I had a student that spent weeks putting a drift fence all the way around a big collapsed lava tube. He was going to capture all the snakes leaving from the overwintering and then coming back. And the badgers would come by and they'd open the traps and kill the rattlesnakes. And uh -huh. uh, another student, former student of mine, was studying. Uh, the, oh, one thing I didn't get to talk about, uh, female rattlesnakes have parental care. After the young are born, they stick with them for a couple of weeks until they shed their skin for the first time. And he had two, he was following 21 females that were, you know, uh, gestating and staying with the babies. And two or three of those ended up being dug up by badgers and killed. Wow. So, and then they have a whole range of adaptations. You know, they're, they're very cryptically colored. You have no idea, probably for every rattlesnake you see, there's 10 to 100 that you don't see. We, we, we would have these radio transmitters in them and you track them around and you could get to within three feet of them. I mean, three feet. And you can't see them. And, you know, the transmitter makes a real characteristic sound of funk when you get close to the animal and you know it's right there in front of you and you can't see it and until it moves 
or rattles, you don't know it's there. I mean, you can't see it. It's, 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 it's very humbling to realize how good their, their crypsis is. One time we pulled 14 rattlesnakes out of a, out of a uh, sagebrush. Wow. Yeah, or we would catch snakes, you know, there out at those, uh, those dens out on the INL. And, you know, we might have a, you know, a bag of 15, 20 rattlesnakes and you dump it out to let the snakes go. And in 30 seconds, you can't see one of them. They just disappear. Wow. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chuck. This has been an amazing night. I also did want to say my deepest apologies to Renee. <laughs> Renee is also on the call. So thank you so much to Renee. The executive director of the Wildlife Foundation is here as well tonight. And I'm so sorry. I didn't, I think I got confused because it just said Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation and I didn't recognize your name there. So Thanks so much for being on tonight, Renee, and thank you to Chuck so much for uh, enlightening us tonight about reptiles of the greater Yellowstone. Okay, well, great. Don't close it down yet. I'm going to do a screen capture here, so I'll see at least some of the people that were here. There we go. And if people have any questions, you're uh, welcome to... Um, you know, welcome to email me. I uh, there's my email address there. And I, I'm happy to hang around for any more questions if anybody has any other questions. Okay, everyone is just saying thank you and that it was a great talk, a rich experience. That's that's how I feel too, there, Emma. Now, um, we talked a little bit about maybe having later in the year having a, um, an in-person an in-person thing where I, I could show some live animals too. Yeah, yeah. So keep an eye out on the nature mapping e-news and the, the general e-newses and stuff. And I'll email you guys if, if we're going to have an in-person, but like Chuck has some snakes and stuff that he can bring. So that might be really cool. And um yeah so just keep an eye out for an email from me i know i send you guys a lot of emails but they're always with cool opportunities like this so it's worth looking at those <laughs> okay well so long awesome thank you so much chuck bye everybody hillary Thanks. it looks like Hello. laurel has a question Oh, oh wow. yeah, Chuck, I just, um, thank you so much. I learned a lot. I'm a very beginner with um, iNaturalist and, um, you know, this ecosystem as well. And today I saw quite a few, what I think are the garter snakes down by the creek by my house. Um, and I was just wondering about, and I think I know the answer, so I'm a little embarrassed to even ask it, but like to try to get a photo of them for iNaturalist, like they were definitely like moving away from me. So I don't want to bug them like all wildlife what what's the protocol for getting photos of these creatures oh it's pretty hard to get any pictures of snakes without bugging them they they know where you are way before you know they're there they um when we were doing radio telemetry studies on snakes i would uh set up a video camera uh, and then I was trying to study their, you know, their warming up behavior in the morning. And I would try to sneak up on them to, to you know, to, to observe them directly, but I'd have a camera out there. I couldn't get 30 feet from those snakes before they were looking around. They, they, they can detect your footsteps and things from a long way. So I wouldn't worry about disturbing them. I just get the picture because they're already disturbed. <laughs> They, they may kind of, uh, sometimes they sleep. And I've, I've sometimes had both rattlesnakes and garter snakes where you come on them and they're just, they just seem catatonic. And you take a snake hook and tap it beside them and then you see they wake up and they get all excited and then crawl away. But uh, they, they often, sometimes if they perceive a predator is there, they won't immediately flee but they'll very slowly move away. 
so yeah i would just get the picture i i, I wouldn't worry too much about bothering them well thanks i might walk down to the creek and just go see what i can see i appreciate yeah, it i'm particularly interested if any of those are common garter snakes yeah okay. laurel that was another thing i was going to say is i have been finding um i found at least two so far of the common garter snakes in the teton valley so that's a really good one to report um and then the other thing I was going to say is one of the common garter snakes I found um, actually just a few days ago, really unfortunately had been hit by a car and was dead in the road. So that's another really great opportunity to provide an observation with a photo because the animal is already unfortunately dead, but it also provides kind of important information about where those animals might have problems with roads and there is uh, mitigation for that, but also just a really good opportunity to include a photo with your post, so. Yeah, and you don't even have to know. And the beauty of iNaturalist is if you get a good photograph, you don't have to know what it is. Somebody else will help you identify it. That's, I mean, I take pictures of lots of things I don't know what they are and then people help me learn. Because, you know, it's a, social network too. You've got people commenting on your stuff and you know confirming it and verifying it. But I would just say, just be aware if it's in your backyard or something and you don't want people, you know, you may obscure the coordinates. There's an option in iNaturalist, it's called geo privacy. And if you're worried like snake dens, rattlesnakes, things like that, I just obscure the coordinates. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chuck. This has been amazing. I know everyone. Oh, Donna. This Donna. Oh, <laughs> Donna's telling me who she is. <laughs> uh, never mind. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank oh, you so much. I see a much. question there that says, is there still a population of rattlers on the east side of Bear Lake? I caught and released a few there. I just had a meeting today with the Fish and Wildlife Service and we were asking that very question. If whoever sent that, Benji Sinclair, I would like to uh, talk to you about that because uh, we're gonna be doing some surveys for with the Fish and Wildlife Service down there. And okay, no problem. Yeah, that ask would away. be really, really <laughs> helpful. They'll be excited to hear that. That's one of the great reasons of doing talks like this is you get to learn things you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. That'd be great. Uh, just send me an email and then we can set up a phone call. Cool. Excellent. We'll do. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Hillary, can you save the chat? I don't know if I can save it or not, but I'd like to look at these comments too. Uh, so I think that was a direct message that Benji sent to you. So I never even saw that question. Um, but I think okay, I was able to save it. I've got it saved here. Okay. It's saved as a text file. So I, I should have all the comments so I can look at those and then. Um, okay. Excellent. Sounds okay. Great. All right. Well, awesome. bye. Bye. Thank you so much. And I'll see everybody soon on another one of these presentations, hopefully. So, <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you yeah. Thank and thank you. you so much to Sherilyn for interpreting. And yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Definitely. All right. I'm going to end the call. <laughs> Take care. Bye, everybody.